Join me, Mark Windows, for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Check out our archive and program stream at windowsontheworld.net. Welcome to this special from Windows on the World, windowsontheworld.net, new show every Sunday, 9.30 p.m. UK time, over 300 shows in the archive, and all of our material is also on Odyssey. The links are on the homepage at Windows on the World. We do not put most of our material onto YouTube because a lot of it has been taken down and we've had community strikes, etc. So we do have everything on the homepage at windowsontheworld.net and you can find all the links there. This special is an interview with Nick Collistrom and we're going to be going over some of the past in other words, some of the books that the author Nick Collistrom has written over the years. And we're going to be talking specifically about the Ukraine war. Of course, the view that has been given by the Western media is absolutely ridiculous. And it's the usual gaslighting. The Allied backed and Ukrainian bombing in Ukraine has actually escalated a hundredfold recently. And the propaganda that the West has been given is absolutely ridiculous. And nothing about this war has been any different from the gaslighting that we see from all globalist exercises. These things are much more complicated on a global level. And of course, there is much more cooperation at the top than the public realise. We go into this in our shows and we've gone into great depth, especially recently. Take a look at the Smart Cabal. That's a fascinating show about the situation in the Middle East. We've got the protocols of power. You can listen to that, how world governance actually operates. And we have everything on the homepage. So here is our interview with Nick Collistrom. Ah, welcome to Windows on the World. In this show, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Nick Collistrom, who I've known for many years, probably since around 2009, as I used to live in Walthamstow. And I bumped into Nick there. And Nick's got a new book out, actually, Ukraine, The Just War. But we've right, known right. each other for such a long time. That's it. There you go, Nick. Yeah, you can get that on Amazon, can you, Nick? Yes, you can. Yeah, amazingly enough, yeah. yeah. Amazingly well, I, enough, I, yes. Well, I don't, mention, of... I don't mention the J word, you see, so it hasn't got banned, you know. Oh, no, we can't mention Jonestown. <laughs> oh, no, right, right. right. So, the, yes, yeah, so and Nick has had several books banned, and... That's the thing with Amazon. Uh, they carry a lot of material, but it's best to go straight to the author. So tonight we're going to be talking about this new book, but also a bit of a background in Nick's work, because he has done some tremendous investigations in the past, including 7-7. And that book is still available on Amazon. And that's called, uh, what's that book called, Nick? Can you tell Terror, me? Terror on the Tube. That's Terror right. And it's also, tube, yeah. that's the name of your website as well, isn't it? Yeah. Oddly enough, that was about the only book about what happened on the London bombing. It's very strange because uh, there's dozens of 9-11 truth books, but oddly enough, there's only that one book, Terror on the Tube, if you want to find out what happened uh, on 7th of July 2005 in London, uh, which I, I find very bewildering. But anyway, It is very strange. bewildering, but you did a very in-depth investigation into that, and that book is kind of unique. And yes, it's standalone because, as you say, nobody else really looked into it to the depth yeah. that you did. Well, I paid, paid a heavy price for it as well, didn't I? I got quite heavy media vilification, you know. Um, ghoulish was their favourite word describing me. I had a ghoulish interest in the dead. I well, I'd find, I... you know, find out <laughs> well, what course, happened. <laughs> because if you question the official narrative, there's always a huge ad hominem attack on the person which I found incredible in your case, because you're not an offensive person at all. And when people meet you, they probably think, who is this fascist Nazi? He's not here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, right. Yes. So, yeah, we met in Walthamstow many years ago. I've followed your work, um, yes, yeah, since before Terror on the Tube, actually. And you've done a lot of different types of work. You also publish a book on lunar gardening, don't you, which may many people may not know about. Well, that might come to an end, actually, Mark. Right. I'm, not, I'm not sure it could did me much good, actually. It sounded a lot silly, but <laughs> that was from a previous lifetime when I used to work on a biodynamic farm um, in my youth, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, the publisher kept asking me to redo it and redo it. So uh, I did keep it going for a while, yeah. It worked. It worked, really worked. Yeah, but you've, you've kept up with your research into many different areas. And this latest book... Ukraine are just war. Maybe we can start with that. Maybe we can yeah. talk about that for a while. Yeah. Well, I was in, we, I co run this 
London sort of conspiracy or politics, uh, political affairs discussion group. We meet monthly in the last 12 years. Uh, and uh, someone there said, well, come on, you got to write a book about this Ukraine war. I said, no, look, I'm not your war correspondent. He said, yeah, go on. He said, you've got a good way of expressing things. And so I said, oh, no, nah, come on. That's not... Anyway, I, I thought about it and I started getting angry about what was happening. And I found myself then starting to write it. And a couple of months later, uh, I, I'd done it. And and the reason I did it was because, not because I claimed to know who's going to win, okay? I, I'm not a war correspondent. It, it's about the amazing depth of deception and mendacity. And it followed on from my previous couple of books about British Intel uh, fabrications, the Skripal and Navalny, okay? If Which you remember, you've also covered, yeah. Yeah, if you remember the Skripal thing, 2018, massive British Intel uh, via, uh, well, accusations of, of poisoning Novichok uh, somehow projected onto Russia, somehow Russia responsible for these two people in Salisbury collapsing on a park bench. Um, uh, and that worked fairly well. And previously, they'd done an earlier one about, uh, what, what was it, Polonium with, uh, with uh, what, what was his name, 2006? Yes, um, Alexandra, what, I, I can't L remember Litvinenko, his name. Litvinenko, 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 yeah. Litvinenko Alexandra yeah. Litvinenko, yes. Yeah, right. Well, I, I, I mean, that was, uh, I mean, whether or not he was possible about that, there was no at all credible links to Russia. It was much more likely to be, um, you, you know, some... British I think the point here, Nick, is that the propaganda and misinformation campaigns run by British intelligence are incredibly crude. And I think the Russians pick up on this. Alexander yeah. Nagrasov, who's no longer with us, used to be quite a presence on Twitter. All and right. he'd been a Russian correspondent for years. Right. And he explained the Skripal thing in about five minutes, as mm -hmm. far as local intelligence on the ground and what people would have done and what didn't happen. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. The, the Russians are way ahead at this kind of propaganda. And I think they get incre incredibly frustrated when they have to go on and talk to mainstream journalists like on the BBC who were basically just giving them back this Marxist rhetoric and right. they can see right through it and they get annoyed. So I think right. they get as annoyed as you did, really, right. which is, I think is an important point. Right. Well, anyway, that all worked so well. They said, well, yeah, yeah why not do it again? So they had Navalny in 2020 in, in Russia. He had some sort of uh, fainted for a bit. And then he recovered and he was perfectly well afterwards. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, Novichok, oh, this is the diabolical Russian uh, and so forth, because he's a dissident. And uh, that worked really well. Uh, and uh, so uh, this was generating. What I found amazing was the way, beginning of the century, uh, as we both discussed at length, the enemy were Muslims, right? Muslims were the bad guys, and all these dreadful things from 9 11 onwards had been done by Muslims. And then suddenly that all came to an end, 2017. Manchester Arena bombing. That was the last big, I would say, fabricated terror event uh, blamed on Muslims. And after that, Islamic terror suddenly came to an end. Where was it? Instead, That's the exactly what happens, though, Nick, isn't it? I mean, when these things become no use anymore and yeah. things have moved on globally, yeah. then we just see a, a sudden and rapid change. But I think that goes through everything, you know, because it goes into how the mimetic war is fought in the UK all the time. In right. other words, things are pushed into the media from nowhere, and then all of a sudden they disappear. So there's no continuity of the story. So that's just the way they do it. It just means that there's a new meme on the horizon. And of course, right. when the Ukraine situation broke out, a yeah. whole new era of virtue signaling and stupidity started. Yeah. And it's to me, it's more of an indication as to the ideological subversion and the acceptance of infiltration of this kind of propaganda in the UK. Well, I, I think so, it's more yeah, to do yeah. with that, really. Yeah. Well, what struck me is the way suddenly the new enemy came. I mean, I, I'd never dreamt that Russia was going to be once again the enemy. Uh, I mean, you couldn't have anyone more mild and civilized than Putin. He was really, really believing in European friendship collaboration and cultural exchange and that's why he was building the big pipeline um right world's longest pipeline and uh, uh suddenly in after 2017 the script all thing was suddenly it was suddenly let's hate russia and there was um crappy british uh, outfits like um uh integrity what was it uh 
uh, what were the uh, these um, some political movements set up? Integrity Initiative for smearing. Oh yeah, the Integrity Initiative was absolutely horrendously comedic because. The, oh. it, there was the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, which was linked to that. All right. And I think Chris Williamson MP went to their remote headquarters and knocked on the door. There's no one there. They went to the the London office and it was slammed in his face. All and right, the yeah. Integrity Initiative and the Institute of Strategic Dialogue yeah. uh, were both putting out these tweets, these, these pathetic, banal anti-Russian tweets, which, yeah. again, was like the, the propaganda is so simplistic. But it's, it was, yeah, it's yeah. kind of it runs through everything. So it doesn't matter whether it's about climate change, whether it's about terrorism or whether it's about COVID. It's right. always the same tactic. Yeah. It's like this offensive against anyone who doesn't agree with the narrative yeah, and was, the ad hominem yeah. attacks. But how come it works so well? I mean, after the Stripple mm. thing, uh, the Stripples were still alive uh, and um, the policemen were still alive. Um, and uh, most people, about four people were still alive. Uh, the cat had been put down. The cat had died. That was all. And t t 200 politicians were expelled. I think that's a number right across Europe. Just because Theresa May said this. Oh, how terrible. Oh, another shock. Dreadful stuff. And suddenly, these Russian politicians were expelled right across Europe. And she also got Trump to expel about 50 um, diplomats, Russian diplomats, just on this crappy story. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I was baffled that you can stoke up this Russia phobia on, on such a um, such a crummy story. Uh, I mean, it's literally about ducks having been killed in in the pond. Yes, um, yes. if you remember it. Yes. Uh, 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 and uh, <laughs> I mean, the only Novichok that ever existed was at Porton Down, which is about five miles down the road from that park bench in Salisbury. <laughs> you know, that's the government's um, biological warfare centre. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, it, that all worked. So a new Cold War suddenly was brewing up. If you go back to the sort of 10 years ago, there was people did not perceive Russia as an enemy. It was uh, it was just any it, that was all in the past. And uh, there was no Iron Curtain across Europe anymore. And uh, and we were bombing Muslim countries. So they were the bad guys. Um, and, and that was it. And then suddenly it changed the last five years uh, and uh i'm amazed how successful this british intel propaganda is it's, it's evil it's completely evil it always tells citizens who to hate and it justifies the enormously burgeoning military budget i mean don't call it defense it's not about defending anything about 50 billion a year mm -hmm. britain's are spending um and uh that money goes to the worst type of human being uh, you know professional killers uh, and th th they will brew up stories to generate the hate to ratify their huge budgets. Uh, and uh, I mean, that is the worst side of, of British culture, I, I think. Uh, and uh, I I'm just uh, puzzled by how all the media accept it. And we haven't got any anti-war party or politician around uh, t to be seen. I mean, we did have Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I bless him. Well, he, really... he turned out to be a useful idiot as well. But the, <laughs> well, the point did, is yeah, that... But that uh, with Corbyn, I think people projected something on him that simply wasn't there. And well, they did. that All was the another form it of simply wasn't there. It was. No, what yeah, I yeah. mean is the, the adoration, because there was nothing really to be adored about him. Well, he's a, come he's on. A it, it, no, he's a yeah, clueless he was, individual in my He opinion. was really, really anti-war. He really didn't believe in war. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, but that it's part of the old Marxist setup. basically. These people came from the, the left. And <laughs> you, if you get sort of involved in those groups... That around Corbyn, the yeah. older lot are all Marxists, and the new lot are yeah, all kind yeah, of that's, middle that's ground, that. new liberal. You know, so yeah. I, I, the thing is with Corbyn that he, he could never have delivered anything because he's completely on board with the sustainable development goals. He's on board with yeah. every globalist bit of propaganda. Right. And he, I think people projected something on him, as I said, that simply wasn't there because he came across as very honest when he was doing his speeches, right. but. It, and, and it seemed that he was putting up a courageous fight, but in actual fact, he wasn't. He capitulated every step of the way and he could have actually won there if it had been a strategist. But I think this brings us back to what we're talking about, Nick, the complete lack of strategy in British pod politics and also the absolutely overwhelming and banal propaganda. And it all comes down to that because the yeah. Ukraine thing was a, a started off with propaganda. When, when Putin said he was going after the drug ad addicts and the Nazis, that's exactly what he meant. So... 
it, people have to listen carefully to what is actually being said from the Russian side because they actually tell you. Yeah. And this is a, the strange thing about the way that things have reversed. In other words, the, the straight talking appears to come more out of Russia. It does, and the absolute yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, subversive propaganda, which would basically be very simplistic on the level of the KGB, is coming out of the UK. And I think that's yeah. that's the, what's going on, really. And that's very bewildering, isn't it? I mean, I can remember mm. when, you know, the last century, you used to think British politicians were honest and you wouldn't believe anything you read in Pravda in, in the Russian news. And now that they, are, as you say, it's, it's weirdly, why well, it's changed around and, and uh, people don't trust European politicians at all. I mean, you know, look at Boris Johnson. He was pushed out so many yes. of his cabinet members queuing up to say talk about his casual mendacity uh, and uh they couldn't trust anything he said and that's basically why he had to resign and um, i think it's the infiltration of this new type of person these change agents into the political arena which has been going on for so long now yeah. and of course the real examples of that are people like matt hancock you know they're basically just trained liars who've been weaponized <laughs> and they yeah. they're just used for their stupidity and their egotism and they'll of course yeah. be cast off and and when the time comes they will be completely discredited or worse yeah but well, there's well, an you, endless queue of them yeah. yeah do you remember how the uh the COVID thing was just fizzling out and they came out with omicron and nobody believed that and there would have been a really bad reaction against what the government had done clamping everyone if it weren't for this russian thing suddenly around the winter of last year, 21, 22, suddenly it starts getting ominous. And, and we keep hearing the mainstream media say, uh, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Well, how did they know that? Uh, December, January, uh, and that was a new a new fear source. Just was the COVID, the COVID thing was just wearing out, wasn't it? People yeah, were, it, was, it was an ideal distraction, basically just yeah. changed tack completely. And then COVID disappears out of the news. I think that's the main thing is that in the UK, as far as the mainstream goes, it just, as I say, it goes from one thing to another. You never yeah. get any undercurrents of news stories available either. So you have to go to really good websites and, and yeah. international journals so for that a, kind of stuff. Yeah, very simple moral, moral, ethical statements of viewers. Uh, don't accept the fear. Don't give in to the fear porn. Hmm. Realise it probably isn't true. Uh, and uh, uh, that they need your fear. That's the most central axiom of, of what the politicians politicians don't have any positive vision about how to improve your life at all. And they know they don't. But they reckon they can get you to listen to them if you can be frightened of something. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I, I urge you, um, you know, try, try not, to, not to accept the fear porn. I know it's rather, can be rather overwhelming these days. Well, I think um, the people who accept it are the people who sit in front of the telly all day and, and take this stuff verbatim. And I yeah. think those people always will, because yeah. if you found out what happened with COVID, I mean, even people I know who were in my own family got sucked into that, even though I said, don't get involved in that, don't take that. Right. But they did because they were sat in front of the TV and they'd been coerced. There was a really strange kind of coercion that went on, even with people who you would think would know better. Right. And that right. to me was a big dividing line into the in inner integrity of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that the infiltration starts when you let one thing in. So in other words, if you fall for one story, you're going to mm -hmm. ultimately leave yourself open to all of them. So you yeah. have to have constant vigilance when you're looking at stuff. And that just isn't there in the UK. No. Well, what I find strange is the way that the uniformity of the media. I mean, how come there's no politicians who oppose the war? Uh, how come there's nobody in power? You get people on the periphery or out, like George Galloway, for example. He's you know right out of power, and he will give you know really good interviews in which he doesn't believe, doesn't think there should be a war against Russia. Or, 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 well, I think Galloway is a complete kind of controlled opposition puppet in a lot of ways. But the thing is that he has been allowed to take a certain position. But when you uh -huh. actually question him on things that, say, you've looked into, like 7-7 or 9-11, he will go with the official story and will tell you you're a conspiracy theorist and you're full of hate. Well, he has to. To have any big platform, I don't think there's much option there. Um, uh, the likes of us couldn't get onto major platforms no. uh, with with any uh, what we'd call truthful accounts of, 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 of events. That is, well, even the so-called um, alternative media don't have me on. Don't they? 
No. Oh, right. <laughs> Only very well, brave ones. Yeah. Well, there's we've got a magazine oh, oh, called yeah. called The Light, The Light, which is given out free um, monthly or whatever. And that did have an honest article about mm -hmm. Ukraine. Right. Talking about how the crisis has been in engendered. Uh, and that's, as far as I know, the only imprint truthful account uh, in, in this country, which I find very extraordinary. That, that, uh, I mean, when socialist, socialist movement was started, the point of it was supposed to be to uh, be instead of war, that the money wouldn't go to war, it would go to the people. Uh, well, and, I think and, that uh, was kind of the cover story, really, of what it's about. It, the, the sort of lefty thing was invented for that in a way. So the Labour Party was completely infiltrated by the early 1940s with right. subversives. And of course, by the time we get to new Labour, it mm -hmm. was completely on the agenda. But I think what's yeah, interesting it's just gone about completely, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. is that... The, There's not, no the, difference between the two parties. No, um, no. I mean, I think those sort of old-fashioned sort of socialists you could have a debate with, but the new kind you can't because they're intolerant. So yeah. th that's definitely changed. Yeah. Because the intellect has been taken completely out of it. It's either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. Yeah. Meaning yeah. anybody. Yeah. Who's very, very, sh the very short yeah. sentences. As you say, very short sentences. You know, yes. we stand with we stand with Ukraine as long as it takes. NATO's a defensive alliance. Very short sound bites that don't require thought. Um, yeah. And, and um, as if some sort of zombie programming goes on. And uh, uh, I mean, a discussion of. Who started this war? How did it begin? Who's responsible for it? Uh, you're just not going to get that at, at all. Um, I mean, well, no, it, and also the people who talk about it, Nick, and the people who support the Ukraine and wear the little flags on their Facebook profiles, they know nothing about the history of the region whatsoever. No, no. Uh, I mean, it's become amazingly brazenly obvious now with Angela Merkel coming out and saying... Oh, she had no intention of. She was co-signing the Minsk agreements. I, I'll just, mm -hmm. I'll just go over uh, briefly. In 2014, after a neo-Nazi coup uh, and a genocide program, then was mm -hmm. initiated by neo-Nazi groups like Azov and Kraken, uh, what warriors? Uh, I won't go into back history of it, but th th they had a policy of eradicating the traditional Russian culture that been part of Ukraine, especially East Ukraine, for a thousand years. Uh, Ancient Russia began in around uh, Kiev, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was their traditional culture. So the program of eradicating that traditional culture, a uh, horrific program, and huge numbers then immediately fled into Russia. And uh, Russia responded by drawing up these Minsk protocols, Minsk Accords or agreements. And they were signed by Ukraine, France, and Germany, as well mm -hmm. as Russia. Okay. And that was for a united, peaceful Ukraine. That's what Russia always wanted. Independent, neutral uh, Ukraine in between East and, and, and West. And the Minsk Protocols allowed the little uh, countries in Eastern, parts of Eastern Ukraine to have some degree of autonomy because of their Russian culture and guarantee they'd be able to speak Russian and so on and so on. Uh, and that was the Minsk Agreement, which was, uh, I, I thought it was really obvious to everyone that that was the roadmap to peace. And uh, nothing happened by way of fulfilling it. We now know that all those years went by, eight years, during which 13,000 uh, Rus Russian-speaking East, East Ukraine people were killed by the constant bombardment, which you didn't really hear about at all in the, in the British media. You, you only get that by watching Russia today. Um, during those eight years, the troops and military of Ukraine were being built up and trained by NATO. So it was absolute hypocrisy signing that, signing those treaties. Anyway, Angela Merkel, we all thought the big climax of her career was going to be switching on Nord Stream pipeline, right? Before before she resigned, that one one assumed was was the way it was going to end. A very you know benign note. She was quite she was a respected politician in Europe. Instead of that, oh no, oh no, don't switch on the pipeline. It was British agents. That were telling Germany don't switch on the pipeline when it was ready. They're instructing Germany not to switch on the pipeline. Can you believe it? Uh, and and uh, so y y you get uh, Merkel comes out and says we had no intention of fulfilling the Minsk Accords. And she was echoing what the Ukraine minister Poroshenko had said a little while mm -hmm. earlier. He said that mm -hmm. also, right? Yep. And then after that, the French. The guy who was the Prime Minister of France signed the Minsk Accords. He also said it. So all three of them came out and said they had no intention of 
enacting those Minsk Accords. And th this, this is something that has been passed unanimously by the United Nations Security Council. They unanimously endorse these Minsk Accords. So uh, a, 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 a UN, UN uh, sanctioned document is, um, uh, we learn, we learn that the word of these statesmen is quite worthless. The signed promise of, of, a, of a peace treaty was quite worthless. And what they actually wanted was to get ready for the war, which was going to come. Uh, and th they've said that explicitly. So I thought there could be, there couldn't really be any doubt that they were preparing for the war and expecting it to come. Um, yes, uh, I mean, the whole point is that the NATO aspect is not talked about much in the UK. In fact, the level of engagement is so low that people don't know what's going on. They don't know that this is a major problem and that NATO is there merely to destabilise and basically to further the goals of this global action plan. Global um, action plan, that, exactly, yeah, yeah. They, they, that involves people break, don't seem to be able to get it. No, in the well, UK. that involves breaking up Russia, hmm. and it's very much uh, mastermind or driven by these Pentagon war hawks who dream about being masters of the universe, you know, and um, especially with the space weapons and everything, they really sort of jack off to that stuff. And uh, whereas European politicians are more, uh, more, under the illusion of NATO being a defensive alliance. I mean, yes. I would say what actually kept the peace in Europe all those years was the Warsaw Pact. Hmm. That was a bunch of countries in between East and West, lying down yes. the middle of Europe, uh, and uh, they stopped NATO going any further. So NATO, once that broke up, the Warsaw Pact, you know, there was this naive promise, a promise that was made to Russia uh, that they wouldn't go an inch further eastwards, but they did. They then moved totally further eastwards. NATO managed to persuade all those little countries that uh, come out of the USSR uh, to uh, become part of NATO. And so NATO, so in a way, the conflict is inevitable, given that NATO has a relentless push uh, eastwards to go up to the borders of Russia. Yes, I mean, I mean, Russia was very patient when you look at the timescale and what was going on. Yeah. And I think he'd considered that for a long time, Putin. You could tell he'd consider it for a long time because when he made that announcement, he was very clear in what he said. And the propaganda from the Russian side has been consistent. So basically, the the propaganda from the Western side has been so banal, as we've said, that yeah. people don't seem to be able to look any further into it than that. And I only did very brief research on it when it when it started, the whole conflict. And right. it was, it's very clear all the information is there for you. You don't even have to, you don't have to dig in it for years on end. Right, you can actually right. get the, the whole picture quite quickly if you understand geopolitics in any way at all. Well, also, if you watch RT, I mean, to find out what those people endured for eight years. Yes. Um, I mean, the loads of landmines, saturated with landmines, electricity cut off, water cut off, no gas, uh, e even the banks. I'm not sure if they were working. So, in effect, they were being treated as an enemy country by Ukraine. Ukraine was bombing its own country, uh, uh, bombing the east of what it claimed was its own country, Ukraine. And uh, then demanding that the citizens, I've been bombed for eight years, will rejoin Ukraine and want to be part of it, which is madness. Uh, ob obviously, I mean, they voted last September. All that, those four little mini states on the east, they all voted by huge majorities, about 90 percent or so, to become part of Russia. That was, that was an election that was held and it was scoffed at throughout the Western media. They said, oh, these are sham elections. These are illegal elections. And not only that, but they threatened, you threatened anyone who over, helped oversee the elections or helped manage them in any way, which is very strange. So, I mean, do you believe in democracy or not? The, the United Nations is supposed to enshrine the right of self-determination. And that's what happened. Those four little uh, mini states all voted to become part of Russia uh, and the Russian parliament then accepted it. So... I mean, I think the question, and that is exactly what you what Crimea had done years earlier, hadn't it? Mm -hmm. In 2000, was it 15? That, that yeah. they had elections, uh, which again were totally dismissed by the West. They said, "Oh no, these are sham elections." Well, why were they sham? What was wrong with them? Well, it because, would be nice if we could have a bit yes. more detail about these elections, 
Yes. I, I mean, I'm not blaming anyone, but there were loads of, there were about 100 observers of those, independent observers of those, hmm. for, for those elections last September. And it would be nice if we could have an account from them instead of just, you see, there's no journalists, uh, that's the amazing thing, no journalists go over to East Ukraine. I mean, it's not incredible. Yeah. Th that is elections there, um, they've been bombed for eight years. What condition are they living in? Do any journalists go over there? You know, Guardian, Telegraph? No, no. In fact, there was an amazing account by this girl, Alina Lip, and she was a tourist. And she just went over there, and, and she decided to start doing interviews of people in the Donbass area of what their daily life was like. And, you yeah. know, they see themselves getting shelled, or, or you hear bombs going off while she's doing the interview, that sort of thing. And um, the German people were rather alarmed by her, in, by her podcasts and she got prosecuted by the german government they said oh no this can't be happening no you must be making this up there must be some russian with a gun pointing a gun at you to make you do all this uh, and and they they emptied out a bank account and prosecuted her uh, claiming that this couldn't be true what she was reporting uh, and uh, as it were that is almost the only that's how they treat the odd the odd person who does go over there i mean i find it just amazing that journalists can be muzzled muzzled in this way uh, and not go out to see what's happening and just print what they're told. Uh, I mean, that is just so bewildering. It's been going on for quite a long time, Nick, and the way that most of these people are trained now by these organisations which mm. are heavily funded. You know, the yeah. whole point about it is that these Soros-type organisations, they mm. fund a lot of these German journalism schools. I did quite a lot of work on it several years ago. Well, right. basically, it just means that you've got one narrative that's that's promoted and anything outside is not true. Yeah. And that is kind of incredible, really, because they advertise themselves as putting out critical thinking. I mean, you've got this thing called the it's it's the it's a kind of union of investigative journalism. It's, a, it's, a, it's like an organization. But what they put out isn't in investigative journalism. It's one sided propaganda. Yeah, so I yeah. think that's the whole problem, that things have been polarised in the UK into that. And it's every single thing. It's not just Russia versus Ukraine. It's every part of the agenda, whether it's climate change, whether it's COVID, whether it's terrorism. Yeah. And there's no debate on the subject whatsoever, no. as you found out over the years. Because no. once you cross that line, there's no going back. Because uh -huh. then you get these organisations well, like Hope uh, Not Hate jumping on you. Yeah, yeah, you do. So we we get that all the time. Mm. Bloody hell! Mm. But uh, I, I think that's partly why people don't read newspapers now, uh, mm. and, and the circulation is declining for all papers. I think that um, people want cheaper and cheaper newspapers, uh, and uh, the journalists, whatever reason, they, they don't do the work, mm. and uh, it's much easier just to print what you're told, and. Uh, um, Anyway, that's that's why I wrote my book. The, the sheer level of deception I, I, I felt um, that that, um, that was involved in uh, in putting out this propaganda, and, and it was a self-destruct operation. What, what the West has done by cutting off the Russian pipeline, billions of cubic meters of, of gas and oil. Um, uh, that uh, the good times are over for Europe. Now Europe is descend going to descend into more and more. Uh, grim times and poverty. Quite well, that's part. the whole point. That's the whole purpose of the Agenda 2030 goals. It was All to right. bring down the West and yeah. the East was going to be allowed to rise to a certain point. Well, Russia's kind of in the middle of that. That's what I find interesting Yeah, right. because they're playing it on different levels. So this is a multipolar game as right. far as I think Russia are concerned. But yeah, it's it a is. bipolar yeah. game yeah, as far is. as the West is concerned in their rhetoric. Yeah. So in other words, they go along with certain things and they reject other things. Yeah, well, what do you think the idea that uh, for America, it has gained, what's it gained from this conflict? Well, it, it's it's selling a lot of its, its gas to Europe. So yeah. it, it's got a whole market for its gas by stopping the Russian gas. Mm. Uh, so that, that is successful. Also, uh, Europe going down, uh, Europe will thereby be much more dependent on America if it's dependent on, on gas. Uh, and uh, th that might be... A major aim that America has, perhaps America doesn't need a, a, another further war. It's in a way succeeded. What, what, one point of view, you could say its goal was uh, the prime goal, a prime aim, I would say, this conflict was to stop the North, North Stream pipeline and 
and stop friendship developing between Germany and Russia. That's the prime reason why NATO exists, I, I, I reckon. But friendship between Russia and Germany mm -hmm. would kind of bring about world peace and, and uh, slowly, slowly bring about some sort of more peaceful world. Uh, if, if friendship could gradually develop between those two countries, those two mighty countries, uh, and, and that's what would have happened if, if, the, or if the pipeline had started flowing. And uh, so it's terribly important on different levels for that pipeline to be blocked. I mean, what a change we had over the course of one year for switching on the pipeline as the great hope for prosperity, peace and well-being mm -hmm. in Europe. And now Germany is sending tanks to Ukraine. Uh, to kill Russians. I, I mean, what a change, you know. Well, it's all it's all about these financial goals because obviously the whole thing is to impoverish the West. That was the whole point. And the, Russia is sitting on a lot of resources and it knows it. Yeah. And that is what to me is very interesting because they can trade with whoever they want. They can, and yeah, they do. right, right. They do, and, yeah, yeah. Well, the pipelines are going eastward now, aren't they? Yes. Eastward moving pipelines now. Uh, and the east is going to, it seems to be, uh, I mean, I like reading this optimist, Pepe Escobar, uh, and uh, he reckons the quad is going to be a future of culture. China, Russia, Iran and India. That mm -hmm. Between those four in the east, some sort of prosperity and new culture will blossom. Yes. Um, I mean, the thing is that it's, it's all about strategy, this. And the... The financial side of it is totally different than the propaganda side of it. I mean, what's going on in Ukraine? It's yeah. been a kind of cesspit for these globalists uh -huh, and these criminals. Sure. Yeah, That's what it has. was about. Say that again. It's, yeah, run, right. it's run by criminals. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's I mean, just look point. at the uh, look yeah. at the, the white slave trade. The girls who get sent off and traded, massive business. And if they don't, they're liable to be used for organ harvesting massive center of organ harvesting mm -hmm. and then ukraine's a massive center of biological warfare uh there's about 20 or 30 different labs have been found all around ukraine they uh, were skirting all the way around that's one of the reasons that putin gave because he said that nato were not only accruing on the borders but these biological weapons factories were on the doorstep and they he was were, extremely yeah. concerned about that. Absolutely, so why, yeah. why would they be surrounding Russia with these biological weapons? Yeah, you get these factories, drones. Which is what they are. Yeah, drones designed to carry mosquitoes. And mosquitoes are infected with some special biological agent, I don't know, anthrax or, or whatever. And, and that's what they found. Uh, and, and they also found plans. And, uh, I mean, the whole world should be grateful to Russia for, for intercepting this. And I just point out, there's a... A strategy of denial by Pentagon uh, Warhawks to deny they're doing this. They call them, was it biological um, threat threat reduction centres? <laughs> yeah. So crappy yeah, yeah. terminology. Uh, and it gets there's a loophole in this biological warfare convention that you can develop these things if you can claim you're somehow trying to protect people against them. Right. Well, that's that's the cover story, isn't it? So cover basically, story, yeah. they 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 put it down as being defences when it's actually offensive. It's, totally, it's yeah, an offensive yeah. thing. So, so basically, yeah. a, a paper came out of the World Health Organization in two thousand and seven called "A Safer Future," and it All talked right. about how they were going to create these threats in countries, and countries that didn't get into line would have something happen to them. <laughs> so the Russians aren't daft; yeah. they're, yeah. they're not stupid about this sort of stuff because yeah. they they know about the propaganda. They know yeah. about what the UN are up to. They know what the World Health Organization are up to. But, of course, what the public don't see is that it's they're working on different levels. So they yeah. may seem to be um, going with the globalist plan in one way, but in another yeah. way they're not. Yeah, so yeah. they can actually make their minds up. But the yeah. thing is that I think at the heart of this is the destruction of Western Christianity. That's the whole point of, of this globalist objective. That right. is the point of it right. when it comes down to it. Well, certainly you know. Russia is 70%, 75% say they, they are orthodox Christian mm -hmm. belief. That's what they will answer. Whereas in the West, about 60%, uh, sorry, in, in UK, say they're atheists. Uh, and uh, so there is a terrific polarity here of, of uh, this country run by, you know, cultural Marxists, atheists, yeah. Satanists, and who knows what. Uh, and I think I totally endorse what you just said, that it's, they're opposed to Russia. It's the last white Christian nation. Uh, um, I think I think that people might find that 
a bit hard to take. But when you know and when you look into this on a very deep level, yeah. that is very near the top. I think that's yeah. very near the top because it yeah, always has been. Totally. That's what happened when they killed the Tsar. That's what happened when the World Revolutionary Movement, the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks took over Russia. Right. I so suppose it did, yeah. yeah. If we think about it in yeah. that respect, that yeah. Russia was uh, a Christian democracy and it was a monarchy, but all monarchies have been destroyed by the globalists anyway. Yeah. And that's quite yeah. interesting. So, so basically what that country's been through is those people know about communism. And countries do, yeah, that know yeah. about communism are far less likely to buy into propaganda, yeah, which is a right, very right. important issue. Yeah. So that the young have to be brainwashed into this new system, right, into yeah. this new globalist system. Right. And the whole of the thing about the sustainable development thing is its goals are the same as the goals of what's happening globally. So in other words... The, right. It has to be tied in to everything. You can't just say it's a war against Ukraine. No, there's different levels to this. Um, and I think we've covered some quite interesting points on that. Would you like to finish off, Nick, with anything else you'd like to say about the book? Oh, uh, well, I was just going to point out, you mentioned the United Nations. We're talking about this biological warfare. What amazed me, Russia brought all these papers and documents and evidence to the United Security Council. Uh, and the security says, oh, no, no, we don't want to watch that. No, this is just propaganda. That's right. just disinformation. Yeah. British and Americans said, no, we don't, oh, no, 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 fuck off. You know, we don't want your stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they, ha they had to. The, the, the UN security would not listen to that evidence, massive load of evidence, uh, and uh, just shows the way uh, coherent thought seems to be disappearing from these institutions that we, we thought. But were also, the, these countries us. that were surrounding with these bases, like the one in Georgia, they they don't want these these uh, biological weapons factories in their countries. They don't want them there. No, they're, not right. they're they're there because of the UN and the World Health Organization and these criminals behind them. And we yeah. all know how COVID started with right. um, Eco Health Alliance, Peter Daszak, Fauci. They're behind right. all this stuff. They're yeah. heavily funded, and right. these are biological weapons factories. So right. this is yeah. a war. So yeah. Russia was pushing back against that war as yeah. well. Because yeah, that's right. a war. It's not just yeah. NATO with troops. This is a yeah. biological weapons war. Yeah, a so total it's, it's threat a, to it's Russia. A, it's, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's multi-dimensional, really. Yeah, but well, just have, have a couple of minutes, Mark, yes. just to go yeah. over the initiation in February of what happens. Because yes. uh, this is amazingly un unreported and terribly dramatic. Uh, ten, ten shells going off per day in uh the donbass that that's that's is ukraine roughly this is osce data uh, uh, so every other day people around there were hearing you know boom boom and the ground was shaking okay suddenly 17th of february that massively increased uh, and there was a thousand about a thousand going off uh, per day so there's an extraordinary increase very suddenly and at the same time there's a huge gathering of ukrainian troops on the border so something big was going to happen uh, were they going to storm across and uh, destroy the Donbass or what? So the, so those many states, Luhansk, Donetsk, appealed to Russia to help us. They said, please help us, 17th of February, right? So there's a massive hundredfold increase in, in the daily amount of bombardment. That was the start of the war. Let's be clear about that. Uh, uh, then what Russia did, it recognised those, those little states. And which it refused to do for nine years because it wanted the Minsk Accords to be implemented. So it didn't recognize their independence, even though they asked for it. So it finally recognized. So the Minsk Accords were dead. And as far as Russia, you know, there's independent states. Then immediately after that, those little mini states asked Russia for, because they're independent, they asked Russia for help. They invited Russia in and Russia came in. So Russia came in, invited on the 22nd. Uh, and, uh, because of the, sh the shelling was coming from across the border, th th they had to go into the mainland of Ukraine as well as going into those little mini states. So I would say that was all entirely in accord with international law and, and it was primarily defensive. It was an attempt, which has not yet succeeded, to stop the process of, of genocide. And uh, so I would argue that uh, what Russia did at the beginning of, of February was absolutely legitimate. Um, and and uh, uh, the world should support should support Russia in this um, 
it's not it's not a question of whether you like the russian culture or not that's not the issue the issue is do you oppose the process of genocide or not okay yeah that's that's absolutely right nick i mean the inability of people to be able to see through the blatant propaganda which we've outlined in this broadcast is the main thing because they have to look at this historically russia has yeah. always been a target and yeah. it still is it's yeah. hated on a level which people don't understand if they don't understand their history. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cheers. Right, Nick. Bye cheers, Ed. Thanks a lot. Bye. Join me, Mark Windows, for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Check out our archive and program stream at windowsontheworld.net.